Hello, Dr. Mintz here. I wanted to go through uh, a, a somewhat interesting case of CT abdomen and pelvis, mainly to uh, go through some of the anatomy here. Now, always important when you're looking at a CT abdomen to look at the lung bases and see what's going on in the pleural spaces. So here you can see this bilateral pleural fluid. You should recognize this as fluid. And you can see that this is part of the lung. And if I change the windowing so that you can see the lung more clearly, you can see that this part posteriorly here is volume loss. You can it's somewhat difficult to distinguish from a pneumonia or other consolidated process, but volume loss, also known as atelectasis, just means collapse of lung. And if you have pleural fluid accumulating to this extent, you can imagine it's going to be pushing upon the lung and the lung will undergo some volume loss. So important to recognize and comment on pleural fluid, at least if it's significant, if it's a tiny little minuscule amount, uh, depending on the situation, I might not pay much attention to it. But here it's worth noting that volume. And then going down a little bit farther, we can see the diaphragm. So here's the right hemidiaphragm and the left hemidiaphragm, or the posterior part of it. As you know, uh, the whole diaphragm curves superiorly over the dome of the liver and generally over the spleen and stomach area. So here is spleen. Here's stomach. Stomach is kind of collapsed. And that gives it a somewhat thickened appearance. And you can see that that's kind of thick because there's not much contrast within the lumen. But in this case, we have something else. We actually have a mass emanating from the margin, from the mucosa of the stomach. And in the past 10 years or so, a new category of tumors has been used to describe gastric-related tumors, and they're called GIST, or GIST, G-I-S-T, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And we've learned that many of the tumors we see, at least here in the United States, that are of gastric origin are of this GIST, G-I-S-T, type. So here we have the stomach, and you can actually see the rugal folds of the gastric mucosa with the uh, oral contrast within the lumen of the stomach here. Now, even though you will not see the stomach anatomy as clearly as you would on an upper GI, knowing that anatomy, you should be able to follow the uh, gastric anatomy pretty well. And, and here, if we go back up, I'll go back up through it. And we come into the top of the stomach here, encounter this mass, this gist tumor, contrast in the gastric lumen. And as we go down farther, we get into the distal body of the stomach here. And then this area where the stomach narrows, which is the pylorus, the gastric antral region, and which in turn, of course, empties into the duodenum. So even though this is not a pretty picture like you would have on an upper GI of a duodenum, just by the anatomy, you know what it is. And here again, for CT anatomy, you have to depend more on anatomic relationships and less on what it looks like. So I know that this is the first portion of the duodenum, so if I go inferiorly from this point, I should see a, con a continuation of the duodenum, and that's this, as it courses inferiorly as the second portion of the duodenum. Now, this is the second portion of the duodenum. It's anterior to the inferior vena cava, which is to the right of the abdominal aorta. Now, if I follow this further, I should see it course off to the left side, which would be the third portion of the duodenum, and there it is, crossing over to the left across the abdominal aorta as the third portion of the duodenum. And at this point, it usually courses slightly superiorly, and it is anchored there by a simple reflection of, of the uh, fascia. And that fascial reflection is the ligament of trites. And people often refer to the ligament of trites as being important developmentally, because if the bowel does not develop normally, the ligament of trites won't be in the normal position, 
and you'll be able to tell that there's something wrong in it because the bowel will be abnormally distributed. You might have all the small bowel on the right side and all the colon on the left, si on the left side, for example. So this then becomes the proximal jejunum. You know that this is proximal small bowel. And here you get into a few loops. So I, I want to emphasize that, that here you can follow the gastric anatomy through the body of the stomach, gastric antrum and pylorus into the duodenum, even though there's not much to see there, which is important. And in upper GIs, we have the luxury of being able to fill up the stomach and distend it and put in air maybe and look at everything nicely distended. But that's not usually how it turns out with CT. So knowing these anatomic relations and the basic anatomy is crucial. So that's the duodenum. And what does it wrap around? It wraps around the pancreatic head. So here is the second portion of the duodenum again. And this is the pancreatic head. If we follow the pancreatic head superiorly, we get into the That's neck. Hello, Bobby. And this is the neck of the pancreas. My son just got home. And this is the body of the pancreas and the tail. Now, where does the tail of the pancreas point? It always, always, always points toward the splenic hilum. Why, why would that be? Because the splenic vein goes right to the splenic hilum. And here we can see the splenic vein here going off to the left upper quadrant. And it's located posterior to the uh, pancreas. And it goes up into the splenic hilum. Sometimes the pancreas can be hard to find because it's very wispy and fatty infiltrated and someone with a lot of abdominal fat. And so a trick for finding the pancreas, and this is an important one, is to find the spleen, find the splenic hilum, and then follow the splenic vein. And you follow it and follow it and follow it, and you see this vessel coursing behind the pancreas, and that is the splenic vein, and it's always posterior to the pancreas. So here, lo and behold, is the pancreas, and you can even appreciate the pancreatic duct, which is sometimes visible, sometimes not. One or two millimeters is okay. Above that is usually considered abnormal. The important vascular anatomy in this area, besides the splenic vein, is to recognize that the splenic vein comes into the portal confluence, as do the superior and inferior mesenteric veins. Now, there are a variety of ways that the superior and inferior mesenteric veins join, sometimes before they get to the portal venous confluence. But in any case, you then have the splenic vein coming from the left upper quadrant or from the spleen, and you have superior mesenteric vein and an inferior mesenteric vein, which are veins embedded within the mesentery, and they come up into the portal confluence. And the portal confluence continues superiorly and up to the right toward the porta hepatis, where it enters the substance of the liver, and here it is, the portal vein. So actually between the portal confluence here and the porta hepatis here, this area, it is the portal vein. And then the portal vein branches into right and left main portal veins and successive levels of branching of the portal vein. So this is how we have venous drainage from the mesentery, which is draining the large portions of the bowel, primarily small intestine, and uh, transverse colon, and, a lot, of, and uh, a lot of that drainage is coming up through the superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein, joining the splenic vein. Let's see if I can show you that clearly. Okay, so joining the splenic vein. So here's the portal confluence. I'll go down a little bit, and you'll see that here you are in the fatty mesentery, the 
root of the mesentery. Here is the superior mesenteric vein, and here's the superior mesenteric artery. You can tell this is arterial. It actually has a little calcification on it. So you have the superior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric artery, and they, as you go downward, branch and give off branches to multiple areas of the bowel. This patient actually has a left lower quadrant colostomy. Okay, so that's key anatomy here, and the portal confluence continues superiorly and to the right toward the porta hepatis where it is a, that length is portal vein and then it branches within the liver. This looks like slight prominence of the biliary ducts, which of course are not enhancing with IV contrast, and they're filled with bile, which is of low attenuation. Now if we look at the abdominal aorta here, and we go back up, we should see two very important branches after you get through the diaphragm, through the aortic hiatus, which is that gap in the diaphragm. And the first of those is going to be the celiac artery, which gives off the splenic artery, the hepatic artery, and the right gastric artery. And if you go a little inferior to that, you get another vessel, which is easily distinguishable as the superior mesenteric artery, the SMA. And it's easily distinguishable because it is normally surrounded by fat like this. Unlike the mesenteric vein, the superior mesenteric artery is surrounded by fat. It dives down inferiorly, going inferiorly, going inferiorly, and here you have SMA, and here you have superior mesenteric vein. And if you watch as I go down, you'll see them start branching, and here they are still, those two vessels there, see them getting smaller and smaller because they are giving off successive small branches to the bowel. So those are the big branches off the proximal abdominal aorta. And if you go down a little further, you'll see a renal artery come off on each side. Here's a right renal artery. And up oh, there it is. There's a left renal artery. Okay, so I'll go up and then let's go down. One. There, it just popped off there, the left renal artery, and you can see it going over here. Meanwhile, you also see a renal vein coming from the kidney, crossing anterior to the abdominal aorta, and going to what structure? The IVC. So the right renal vein and left renal vein both go to the inferior vena cava, the IVC. And the IVC itself, if you go superiorly, enters the liver enters the substance of the liver here, and more superiorly, you see converging on the IVC these venous channels in the liver. Well, we've already talked about venous channels in the liver, and those are the, meson those are the, uh, the, the portal veins branching from the main portal vein. But up more superiorly, you have the hepatic veins, which are the veins which drain the liver into the inferior vena cava, which then goes into the right atrium as unoxygenated, deoxygenated blood, which needs to then go to the right ventricle in the lungs. So that's a little overview of some of that key anatomy. Email me with any questions.